But I want to recap quickly some of the things that we talked about last week. Uh, last week, we were talking about uh, the sin of sloth. And uh, we talked in general about what this season of Lent is, that it's a time for remembering our Lord Jesus Christ um, as he faced Satan in a, in a state of total deprivation and weakness, physical deprivation, having gone 40 days uh, without food. In Luke uh, 4.13, we're told that even after Jesus had rebuked the, the devil three times, that Satan went away uh, after finishing tempting Jesus, but he didn't go away forever. He said he went away and waited for a, no, a more opportune time. And uh, so Jesus continued to be tempted through the years of his ministry. And uh, a real um, evidence of Satan being present was in the last night of Jesus' life in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, when he was praying to the Father and uh, in his humanity, as any of us would, praying that he would be delivered from the cup that he knew was to come. And Satan was right there bidding him on um, to not take that cup. But Jesus, as always, was faithful. We remember our own need for repentance, continuing repentance, in the face of Satan, Satan's temptation to us. And we're not strong enough to resist all on our own. We need that Holy Spirit guidance to walk with us each and every day. We remember Jesus' uh, focused journey to the cross from his, the beginning of his ministry as soon as he was baptized in the Jordan River. And uh, he knew where he was headed some three years down the road, but he never wavered at all from that steady uh, journey to the cross starting out with that deprivation and having to face Satan face to face. We remember that Christ died to sin, and in his conquering sin, we, accepting Christ, have also died to sin. Paul talks about this quite a bit in um, his epistles. And we remember our own mortality. Many of you were here, came to the church, or dro drove through on Wednesday for Ash Wednesday to have the ashes imposed on our foreheads on that day. A symbolic act, but one that carries some meaning as we repeat the words, from dust you were born, and to dust you shall return. Um, J.D. Walt of the Seedbed and New Room uh, Ministry had a, a uh, Zoom-type Ash Wednesday service later on on Wednesday evening and JD said something that I found very interesting that he and, and very meaningful he said um, that we were born in from the dust of the earth and we will return to dust as our bodies decay in the end but in the meantime in our living time we live by the breath of the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit's breath in us which gives us life so from nothingness to death, we live in the breath and spirit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we are walking with that Holy Spirit during these 40 days together, looking to come to um, a place of, of greater holiness in our lives through these virtues. So that's what the focus of our study is. It's to focus on the virtues. We'll be talking a lot about the sins, but we don't want to dwell only on the sins. We want to look forward to the heavenly virtues. We envision the Garden of Eden being recreated when we're reunited with God and with Christ in his holy kingdom. And these virtues existed in the Garden of Eden before the fall, and they will exist without the sins uh, when we're with Christ in his heavenly, ki heavenly kingdom. Each of the seven deadly sins is a perversion of the virtue in which we were created. And we talk about those each week as well. So we're going to take on the positive and emphasize the positive and instead of just trying to defeat or deny the temptation of the sin in our lives. So last week was about diligence. Synonyms were industriousness, perseverance or joyful obedience to God 
as we respond to the temptation of the sin of sloth. It brings us joyful obedience when we um, obey and follow the Holy Spirit. Fruitfulness in our lives and abundance to, of life itself. It's an, we are nourished by the spiritual guidance, of the, uh, the, the spiritual principles or disciplines that I mentioned last week. Prayer, Bible reading, Bible study, meditation, and so forth. And we'll be adding to those uh, a little bit tonight and in the weeks ahead. And uh, that diligence, as is true with all of the virtues in the study, the virtue leads us to growth in faith, leads us to that abundance of life that Jesus told us it is God's will for us, that we would have life and have it abundantly. So now we remember our memory verse for the entire seven weeks of the study. Anybody remember what it's from? This is not on the screen yet. What's our memory verse? Romans 12, 2, right? Okay. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, we, we love to come to Bible studies. We love to go to Sunday school class. We love to read the Bible and gain information about God and about our Lord Jesus Christ and God's will for us. We hunger for information. And we're consistently, however, drawn into this world. We are not of this world, but we are in this world. And so as we're gathering information, we also are still bombarded by the sins of the world and by the wiles of Satan each and every day. So even though we like to be informed, we like to get information, God doesn't want to simply inform us and give us a knowledge. He wants to transform us, make us completely different. He does that in part by, and it's in this verse of Romans 12 too, by the renewing of our minds. And when you think, read renewing of our minds, we do think in terms of gaining knowledge and gaining information. But as it's used in Romans 12 too, that's not exactly what it means. It's renewing our minds towards a wisdom, but it's a wisdom of God. It's a wisdom of knowing Him. Um, the Bible tells us that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Not the gaining of information, but the fear of God. That doesn't mean that we're supposed to be trembling in our boots all the time, being afraid of God, this big, great God. No, it's a total healthy respect for God and an awe and awe for God as the creator of everything that is and uh, of his awesome love for us. It's that overall awe. Now, there are two imperatives in the first sentence of Romans 12, too. Imperatives are command verbs. The first imperative is do not conform. Do not conform to this world. It's an active verb. You do not do this. It's, um, we are in the world, but not of it. So we're not to conform to what's going on around us, even though we're tempted each and every day. The second imperative is be transformed. You notice the difference in the verb. It's not an active verb. It is a passive verb. It's in the passive voice. Be transformed. It doesn't say transform yourself by the renewing of your mind but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's not something that we're supposed to do on our own or even can do ourselves. We are transformed by our attention to, our acknowledgement of, and our cooperation with the Holy Spirit. So the by the renewing of your mind here is not referring to being informed and being real smart about knowing the Bible, although that is important. Uh, to gaining more knowledge, but it's about renewing our own wisdom about who God is, 
who God is and our relationship with him. So what we're about here is not a quest for knowledge, but a quest for holiness. And that comes through transformation. It's a quest for being more Christ-like. So our verse for this week is from Philippians 4, 4, and the beginning of verse 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I say again, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all. So we're going to be talking about temperance tonight, but I also have some other synonyms that go along with that. It's kind of hard sometimes to put a label on what the virtue actually is. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about temperance. In fact, this verse from uh, Philippians, I think, is the only place that moderation is used as a word. And um, I didn't find temperance either, except I think it's in the King James Version. But one of our points from last week was that Jesus came so that we would have life and have it abundantly, from John 10, 10. And as with so much of our Bible reading and study, we have to take care not to pervert by making absolutes out of God's um, righteous leading of us, his guiding principles and truths. So there's a danger in taking God's good, good uh, gifts and through misuse, overuse, or misappropriation, turning the blessings into tools for Satan to use to tempt us and others further. And that's what the case is today with our robber of holiness that's given the name of gluttony. I mentioned last week um, a Lenten devotional that was being offered by a young lady, and at the end of her introduction to this 40 days, she said, and we're going to be in 40 days of decrease. Remember, I said that last week, and it really struck me as, wow, that's really negative. Um, but I got to thinking about it more this week in thinking and reading and studying about gluttony. This is one where we really do literally talk about decrease as being a virtue, and it's one that we do have some control over as well. So I want to point out that um, of, of the seven deadly sins, there are only two that are sins of the flesh. This is one of them, gluttony is the sin of the flesh. The other is lust, which unfortunately we'll get to and tackle in a couple of weeks. But all the others are sins of uh, behavioral, emotional, how we do, but not actually a sin against our own flesh. The early church fathers uh, saw gluttony as a thief stealing in. And of course, they lived very austere lives with very little caloric intake. But they saw it as a thief thief sneaking in to draw us away from God and that's how they define sin is being drawn away from God so when Satan Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness the first temptation had to do with food he was hungry real hungry thirsty too and Satan of course said if you are the son of God <clears throat> tell these stones to become a, lo a loaf of bread that's in Matthew 4 3 in fact, when the um, Holy Fathers, Desert Fathers, and the early Church Fathers made the list of the seven deadly sins, gluttony was number one, number one on the list. In the ensuing 17 centuries since them, um, they've been pretty much reordered. And I think oftentimes we think of gluttony as, uh, that's not even really a sin at all. It's a, it's a habit that we need to deal with because of, you know, getting overweight or whatever, but it's, is it really a sin? Um, we come to that gray point in thinking of this particular list of sins, and why are these the ones that are on there? We also come to a point uh, where some of these, these sins actually overlap each other and have very similar meanings. Um, 
gluttony has a lot in common with both greed and envy that we will talk about in weeks ahead as well. And this reminds us of Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are commanded to, to, te- to treat it as such. Um, exercise, which is the antithesis of sloth that we talked about last week, and proper diet, which is the antithesis of gluttony that we're talking about tonight, both lead to godly good health and being in in good condition, taking care of that uh, temple of the Holy Spirit, which our body is. So we keep in mind that during Lent, we're remembering Jesus' 40 days of starvation, which, at least by some of the accounts, was all before he ever met up with Satan. And some interpreted that it was during meeting up, but in any case, he was starving. He was thirsty. He was deprived physically. And also remember that we are physically, we are symbolically participating with Jesus deprivation also um, with his death to come and going towards the cross. So Jesus was deprived, self-deprived, of the basic necessity of food. He was at the very edge of of um, the limits of human existence, being able to stay alive as weak as one could possibly be. His body needed food. So Satan first played on that first basic human need. He probably figured this was the only temptation he was going to have to throw at Jesus, (laughs) that he certainly would turn the rocks into food and have something to eat. There are plenty of stones all over the place. I mentioned this last week that Jesus could have made a whole bakery full of, full, full of food and one, uh, one word out of his mouth if he had chosen to do that. But instead, Jesus replied, it is written. Remember, we talked last week about Jesus was prepared for Satan because of his upbringing. He knew the scriptures and he used them throughout the gospels. But he says, It is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus was actually quoting from uh, Deuteronomy 8, 3. And we have those words in Matthew 4, 4, the response to Satan in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. So as we go forward a little bit, um, I think you have in your sheet, that there's um, a list of the, of the seven sins that are there. It'll come up in a minute. You, those of you on, on uh, YouTube or Facebook will see that coming up, but you all have it in your handout. There it is, the seven sins. We, um, we mentioned last week that the men went through David Long's book, the second book of the trilogy, and uh, we did this in, in that study. I would like you to think in terms of, we, I just have them listed in the order that we're doing them in this study, which is just completely arbitrary, really. But in your own life and in your own uh, temptation, your own struggle against sin, how would you rank them from the most to the least um, intimidating to you in dealing with Satan and his wiles to us? And you can go ahead and do that as, as we go uh, through, or you may want wait and do it a little bit later on. I don't think we have time to take a a whole lot of time with it um, here during this time together. But it's a, I think we probably, most of us would have um, very different order of the uh, priority of the sins in our own lives. See, Jesus in his humanity uh, chose God's word over self-fulfillment. And that brings us back to this, this gluttony. He could easily have glutted, glutted, is that a word? Taken, sated himself on all the bread he wanted by turning the rocks into, into uh, bread. But he chose to not do that and to be faithful to his calling. So yes, glut, gluttony can and does usually relate directly to food, to hunger, to, to being filled and to being overfilled, which 
I don't know about y'all, but I do it quite often. Uh, in the book that I've mentioned, Dr. David Long's book, From Deadly Sin to Divine Virtue, um, David posits the, the noun abstinence as the virtue. Uh, I've kind of chosen temperance as the one that's there. So we're going to look at the heavenly virtue response to gluttony using uh, several different nouns today that each of them have the same basic meaning, but they have their own individual meanings as well. Um, he posits abstinence as the right word. And I think there are some others that may more accurately reflect our response um, to gluttony and to the temptation that we have to overindulge. I think that abstinence is a little bit too narrow of a view of this whole issue, uh, but it does offer valuable instruction um, that if you abstain from, from food, then certainly you're not overeating. Um, first, remember that food is a necessity of life, so abstinence from food is not realistic for any extended period of time. And yet fasting can be a valuable antidote to overeating, uh, to gorging on food. And I didn't mention fasting as one of the spiritual disciplines last week when I gave the list of prayer and Bible reading, Bible study, meditation, journaling, and so forth. But fasting is a valuable um, spiritual discipline. It's just one that's not as easy as the others. Uh, it's, it's not easy to do. We get used to having our food. and We get used to having what we like, when we like it, the set periods of the day, and so forth. But it is, um, it's a means of grace, which we talked about a little last week. It's a means of spiritual formation becoming closer in relationship with God. Fasting is almost always, when it's mentioned in the Bible, not given as by itself. Go out and fast. It's almost always coupled with, anybody know? Prayer, right? With prayer and fasting, you do this, that, and the other. Um... In Matthew 17, 21, it's also in Mark chapter 9. After Jesus had taken Peter and James and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration for that glorious appearing with Moses and Elijah on the mountain, and he comes back down to where the other disciples were, and they had been curing, healing, dealing with people and their normal problems which is what they were supposed to do. But there was a man there whose son had been inhabited by demons for some period of time. He would thrash himself on the ground and froth at the mouth and all of that. And the other eight disciples that had been down there were unable to do anything about casting out the demon from this boy. And uh, they're kind of disappointed and frustrated. And here comes Jesus with Peter, James, and John walking up. And, and uh, the father says, Master, um, you know, this is the condition of my son. They've been unable to heal him. Will you heal him? And Jesus did. He commanded the demon to come out of this boy. And the father and the boy go their way. And the disciples then say, Master, why were we unable why were we un unable to cast the demon out from this boy? And he says something that's really very mysterious. We've got to ponder. I'm, I'm not sure I know exactly what it means. But he said, this type can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. By prayer and fasting. I don't know if they'd prayed and fasted or not. I'm kind of assuming that they did not. But... That was Jesus' instruction to them. There is some spiritual power that is available to us when we combine fasting and prayer together. And usually I think when we think about fasting and we hear about fasting, we think in terms of food, don't we? 
You know, I'm going to go without some meals and I'm going to be hungry. But Jesus taught his followers to fast, and he also taught them the proper attitude for fasting and the behavior for fasting. And it's much like his instruction to the, to, uh, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, actually, about prayer. When, when you pray, you don't go out on the street corner and holler, holler, holler out your prayer to everybody. No, when you pray, the essence of prayer is so personal that you should go into your closet and spend time in prayer with Father God. And it's not only for that that it's to be personal um, and alone with God in that time, but it's also so you're not drawn into the, the sin of pride that you are out praying to show yourself as a godly person, one worthy of praise because you are praying. He has similar instructions on fasting. Um, it's in Matthew 6, 16 to 18, just a short couple of verses there. But when you fast, don't put on sackcloth and throw ashes over yourself. Sackcloth and ashes was a sign of, um, of, of grief of grief or um, mourning and uh, when somebody had tore their cloak and uh, put ash through ashes over themselves this was a sign of oh you know I'm I'm really down in the dumps and I'm, I'm now doing something very holy you should be looking on me in that way that's not how we're to fast we're to fast very privately as we are in um, as we are in prayer. I want to violate that instruction of Jesus for a minute um, to Rachel's and my own situation. Um, I've, I've tried to fast for years and years and years and never you know, got more than a day or so of doing it. Um, and I never really thought it was all that important. I had other ways to be in spiritual disciplines and I didn't really feel the need to fast. Um, but some time back, it's been a pretty good while back now, um, I was led by the Holy Spirit, and I do not know why. He said, um, you need to fast on Tuesdays. You need to fast on Tuesdays. So I said, okay. And I said, I'll just start doing it. Um, and I found that uh, it is doable. <laughs> I didn't think it was before but it is doable, and Rachel has joined in doing that. We do that together. Um, but what fasting is supposed to be is to not deny the hunger and the bodily need for nutrition, but to understand that when you are hungry during the day, you're going to feel that need. You're going to feel that hunger. You're going to feel that pang for, give me something to eat. And when you have that pang come upon you, it's an opportunity to recognize that the Holy Spirit is there. And rather than saying, I'm hungry, I've got to get something to eat, and oh, what a, what a good person I am because I'm not running to the refrigerator or the pantry. But to think instead, this is an opportunity to know that Jesus is there and the Holy Spirit is there, and to think, um, Lord, I need your help. I need you with me during this time of limited sacrifice, but also just to be in a time of recognizing that Jesus is there and to say thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, John Wesley was uh, all about fasting, but in a way, he was kind of a cheater on it. <laughs> he only fasted for about 12 or 14 or 16 hours, but he would do that a couple of different times during the week. And, but we, we read of that. We, we read about people having the fasting. We think about or read about those early church fathers, the, the church fathers in the desert who would go long periods of time without eating. Even when they ate, they ate very little. And I think I said last week, many of those desert fathers during Lent would actually go the 40 days without eating anything. There's no way I could do that, but um, 
I don't think so. <laughs> I have enough trouble with one day. Um, but then last week, you know, Ash Wednesday was on Wednesday. And Rachel read JD's thing and said, you know, we're supposed to be fasting before that service on Wednesday night. <laughs> so we kind of did a double dip on the fasting for those two days. And I cannot imagine what it was like for Jesus or for the Desert Fathers who did this to go 40 days without eating. We had a young lady in our church about 25 years ago that was uh, called from the University of Georgia to go to China in a mission trip. And there's all kinds of things about going to China. She couldn't take her Bible with her and all of that. And um, she decided that in preparation for her mission trip to China that she was going to fast for 40 days. Now she took fruit juices and broth, but she didn't eat any solid food for those 40 days. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So uh, the scripture and the early church fathers tied prayer and fasting together as a spiritual discipline or disciplines for effective discipleship. Um, in Acts chapter 13 and in Acts chapter 14, um, early days of the church, they talked about the early disciples being together and, and getting together in a time of prayer and fasting together for their ministry and for the life of the new church. So fasting, um, which is abstinence, can be an effective way um, to conquering or dealing with gluttony as it relates to food. But what about all the other ways that our hunger for things other than food uh, assail us all the time? We hunger not just for more food, for that second, third, and fourth helping plus dessert, but we hunger for the more of the things uh, in our life that we would like to have more of. They confront us every day. Hunger for power. Hunger for prestige. Hunger for things, physical things or relationships that may not be healthy. We hunger for physical pleasure. These relate to gluttony just as much as food does. And they teach us also what they teach us. Um, and some of these will be dealt with in the weeks ahead as we talk about greed and envy and lust. I'd like for us to, instead tonight to, uh, instead of focusing only on the food, to direct ourselves back to our main focus for the study, which is our quest for holiness, our transformation. We are walking with the Holy Spirit towards holiness by taking on more of these heavenly virtues. So instead of succumbing to gluttony, we can join with the Holy Spirit to bring us to holiness through moderation, through temperance, and through self-control. They're all synonyms of abstinence, but each has a little different nuance <clears throat> on how we think about those nouns. So we remember our verse for this week, Philippians 4, 4 and 5. Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all. At the beginning this afternoon when I said that, I, I emphasized that word rejoice a couple of times. And it's intentionally repeated twice in that sentence. Certainly this is an action verb. It's what we're supposed to do. And it's another imperative sentence like Romans 12, 2 is. Do this. You know, rejoice, be joyful, be joyful. So what is it that brings us this joy? It's the, is it the congratulations we get when we do something that um, other people see as being righteous or holy? Is it the joy that we get when we do something for someone else that's in need? Certainly we feel good about that. But that's not the kind of rejoicing um, that's, that we're talking about here. 
No, the joy comes in, in this verse from Paul. The joy comes from that noun of the second sentence, the moderation. And I think it's the only place that's used in the Bible, moderation. Be, in Philippians later, he says, be content. Be content with whatever your situation is. Uh, no matter how dire your circumstance, we're to be content with it. And that kind of relates to moderation, too. <clears throat> but we don't rejoice because others think we've done something great, or done something special, or even that we think God thinks we're great and wonderful because we've done it. We rejoice at the gift of moderation itself, that I have that wonderful plate of food that Rachel has prepared and put before me, and that I've taken it in, and I may want two, three, or four more helpings of it. And usually, a lot of times I do, but there is a satisfaction, there is a joy in moderation. Uh, my mom's family, she, she, her, her family was from England, and she had, uh, they had a kind of a saying for Sunday afternoon dinner whenever we would get together at my nana and grandpa's house. And, my nana was a great cook. Her father was a butcher. And uh, so we had great roast beef and Yorkshire pudding and stuff. And the saying they had at the end of the meal was, and my mom used it really until the day she died last year, is I've had elegant sufficiency. <laughs> I've had elegant sufficiency. That was the uh, kudos to the chef and the preparation and thanks to God for providing the food to us. And it's saying, that was really good, and I'd really like to have some more, but I'm not going <laughs> to. We're going to stay pat with, uh, with what I've already had. It's good for us to have moderation, um, and it's good for our relationship with God. In 1 Corinthians 6, 12, Paul says, um, well, actually, the... Um, yeah, he, he's telling the people, I have the right to do anything. I have the right to do anything. But not everything is beneficial for me. I will not be mastered by anything. And see, in gluttony, we're making ourselves come under the mastery of whatever it is that we want so bad. We don't think in terms of moderation, of uh, abstinence, or the other nouns that I'm going to use. So we're going to look at these three synonyms for virtue, and, and moderation is the first of them. My dad had a saying um, all his life that he, he, it was like scripture, but my dad wasn't a scripture kind of guy and kind of surprised me later when I read this verse in Philippians. But his, his mantra was, son, in all things moderation, in all things moderation. We didn't have a whole lot of money anyway, so there wasn't a whole lot of food on the table. And even if I'd wanted more, sometimes there wasn't any more to have. But in all things moderation, it's really a good proverb to live by. Um, he meant that I was to be moderate in what I saw as my own needs. And I'm the only child, so there wasn't anybody else there to take away from me. Be it food, especially desserts, ice cream, and so forth. Um, cake, whatever it might be. The unfortunate thing um, is my dad didn't live by his own uh, proverb when it came to drinking beer. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, a little bit too much of that. Eventually he did. But moderating and limiting our own desire for the more is pleasing to God. It's thankfulness for what we have and not a demand for what we think we need or more really want beyond uh, what is given to us in the great blessing that God gives to us. Moderating or limiting our own desire for more is pleasing to God, and it's a step towards holiness. It's a step towards being Christ-like. You know, we don't have any pictures of Jesus, but I, I see him as being a pretty slender guy. <laughs> you know, in the time we hear about him eating with his guys, there doesn't seem to ever be a whole, mo whole lot there. There by the Sea of Galilee, there was only five fish and two loaves or the other way around to feed 5,000. So none of them was glut being gluttonous on that day. 
that is pleasing to God and a step towards holiness. The one thing we do not want moderation in is holiness. Do we? We want all of it that we can get. We just put our own roadblocks in the way of getting there by not uh, walking with the Holy Spirit toward that holiness. We want to do it our own way, which often includes uh, wanting the more of whatever it might be. So moderation is one of the nouns. Temperance is the other one I mentioned briefly, and I believe this was the, uh, the one that I put on the sheet, and it's the one that David Long used in his book, I, I believe, as the virtue um, that we use to defeat gluttony. Um, it's a word that the church fathers proposed as the antithesis uh, to gluttony. But to the church fathers, temperance and abstinence meant exactly the same thing. To me, temperance means more like moderation, that it's some but not too much, that sort of thing. Um, later, it came, temperance came to mean specifically uh, absence, total absence from alcohol. The temperance movement of the early 20th century, which I believe actually started in the 19th century, and it grew and it grew. It's one of the wonders of jurisprudence that that temperance led to a constitutional <laughs> amendment. Um, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. The Women's Christian Temperance Union. Very fitting or meaningful that they had the word Christian in, their, in, in the title of their group, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which pushed the uh, concept of prohibition during that time. And, of course, they had come through churches that spoke very directly and vehemently against uh, alcohol and about the sins of alcoholic intake. But it kind of took on its whole new meaning in society as um, we moved forward in the early years of the 20th century. And lo and behold, prohibition became the law of the land when the 18th Amend Amendment was passed. Um, seemed like a good idea to the women of the Women's Christian Temperance Union and most of the preachers in America at that time turned out to be a disaster to the country, didn't it? It led to the Roaring Twenties, it led to, led to the growth of the mafia and the mob across America. Um, people were going to get their alcohol, you know, one way or another. And the, uh, the mob became the conduit for providing that. And the speakeasies were created where you had to surreptitiously knock on the door and say a password through the window to be able to get in. Um, but it turned out to be such a disaster to nationwide crime, poverty, more broken families, more um, broken individuals than would have been if moderate use, temperate use of alcohol had continued to be allowed. And of course, after a while, we had um, to repeal the 18th Amendment. But by then, much of the damage had been done. The mafia was firmly ensconced in our country. And it took, um, they're pretty much in control, out of, you know, being controlled now. Um, but th through the 50s and 60s and even in the 70s, they controlled drug traffic and uh, alcohol and prostitution and all kinds of things in our country. So the, the lesson to be learned here is the absolute of the abstinence or the temperance or whatever it might be, aside from being not practical when you're talking about food, it may not be the best idea. My dad probably had it right to begin with. All things in moderation. And then the moderation is the, the real temperance. Um, in terms of Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon, and Narcotics Anonymous, those kinds of groups, self-help groups of today, abstinence is literally none, right? And there, there's a time when that is appropriate because when the body becomes addicted to something, 
then the only cure for that is total abstinence to get away from it. And, um, you know, people that have successfully gone through those programs know that 20 years down the road, they might sit down with somebody and have a drink and be right back where they were before going through it. And it's a, it's a sad state of being, but once we've alternate, altered our own psyche to believe that it needs whatever that is, and we no longer uh, give it to them, there's a, there is a constant calling. And that's why Alcoholic Anonymous groups meet weekly. Um, and no matter how long they've been in it, the successful programs, people go and go to their meeting weekly and they get up, the first thing they do, my name is so-and-so, I'm an alcoholic, acknowledging uh, that addiction that they have. So temperance, um, again, if it's moderated, I think is a good thing. Total temperance has its place but sometimes we go over the board on the abstinent side rather than on the moderation side. Other examples of um, temperance that don't have to do with food or alcohol or drugs, restraint from revenge by practicing nonviolence when we're confronted with the situation, and forgiveness towards that nonviolence. Um, um, temperance from arrogance by pr practicing modesty and humility. Temperance from the need for luxury by practicing simplicity, which is another spiritual discipline, by the way. <clears throat> and these also will be addressed in other sessions when we get to greed and envy and some of the others. So the next um, synonym for temperance, moderation, abstinence is self-control. Self-control. And self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit that we have definitely given to us in Galatians chapter 5 uh, t verses 22 and 23. <clears throat> Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Last of the eight. Which is what it's talking about. Controlling our belief that we have a need for something that's not going to be beneficial to us or to others around us. When we, are, when we accept Jesus Christ and we are justified before God um, in his sight, we're not holy at that point, but we're justified before God. And when we do that, when we come before God and before the church and we proclaim the belief we have in our heart and say with our mouth the words that we proclaim our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives and that he is the Son of God. <clears throat> when we do that, we're justified in God's sight. And when we do that, we, in our own mind, we know we're not, we're not wholly righteous uh, at that point, but we set up some boundaries in our life that, okay, uh, to be in right relationship with God, I walk here, the narrow path, and I know I'm going to get out here from time to time towards the edge of that path. But we, we set these boundaries that we know there are certain things that we probably used to do that we're not going to do anymore. And one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is that when we get to cross over that boundary, he kind of taps us on the shoulder. Man, woman, get, get back in bounds. Remember who you are. You're a new creation in Christ. <clears throat> so we're justified. We set boundaries and limits uh, to our relationship with God that we intend uh, to not overstep. Self-control is realizing when we have stretched outside the, the, the sidelines of the boundaries or are about to stretch those limits that would or at least might separate us from God and his perfect will for us. And that goes back to the Romans 12 too, the renewing of your mind 
See, in this context, the Holy Spirit is helping us to renew our mind that, hey, you said you would go, you might go this far, but you're not going to go that far. Remember that. Renew in your mind what your own limits are that you have established or what God has established for you and which you have agreed to. That's the renewing of the mind. And then we modify our behavior to step back in bounds and to stay in relationship with the Lord our God and continue walking towards holiness and not to throw it all away um, by going outside those bonds. And again, <clears throat> looking at um, you know, the alcoholic recovering, that's a very real threat to them every day because the boundary is always right there. And it's so easy, it's so easy to step over that line. And uh, there are others who are wanting to entice them to do that. Um, Got to stay in the boundaries. So I have three short examples from the Bible that, that kind of deal with this self-control, moderation, temperate, uh, temperance, or abstinence. The first is from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. <clears throat> in chapter 1 of Daniel, he and his friends have been taken from Israel by Nebuchadnezzar to uh, Babylon to be groomed. At that point, this was before the general exile of the Jews. Nebuchadnezzar was handpicking um, the nobles and the best of the youth that he intended to bring into his court and to develop them, to groom them, to be the perfect Chaldeans as an example to all the nations around. So he brought Daniel and his three friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he had all this great food of the Babylonian culture that was to be their food, and it was to be the healthy food that would make them strong and would make them healthy, make them be the kind of men that he wanted them to be. Daniel said no in the face of Nebuchadnezzar and his lords that were watching over them. No, no, this is what I eat. He was a kosher eater. He ate what was prescribed by the Jewish law. And uh, the chief guard of, of Nebuchadnezzar said, oh no, you know, you, he's going to cut my head off if you don't eat these foods because this is what the king has demanded that you eat. And Daniel said, well, how about this? Go to him and ask him to let me eat my regular food for 10 days and then see how I'm doing. And the king agreed to that. And after 10 days, the guard went back. The king said, well, guess what? Daniel and his boys are the fittest of the bunch. <laughs> they haven't taken your food. It may be a little bit of a stretch saying this has to do with gluttony, but I think it does because um, Daniel and his, and his friends had a spiritual discipline about this is what I eat and only so much of it. And I don't need all those good, rich foods that, Nebuchadnezzar is trying to put before me, and God is going to keep me, uh, keep me pure. The second example comes from Paul's instructions to the Corinthians, uh, again in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and in 12 and 13, this is actually in the context of sexual sin, but it relates to several of the others too. He says to them, to the Corinthians, you say, quote, I am allowed to do anything, end of quote, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. That is true enough, though someday God will do away with both of them. In other words, the food is given to you for sustenance of life. He gives you all you need of it. You don't need all that extra that you think you need and really just want. And then also in 1 Corinthians, um, it's in the context of the Holy Meal, of Holy Communion. I believe it's in chapter 10. And Paul's really getting on the Corinthians for their behavior because they're coming to the Holy Meal, they call it the love meal. And they would come and probably partake of the actual broken 
uh, loaf and the sip of, of wine or juice that was given to them in the holy meal. But that wasn't the whole thing about this love feast. They would bring their food, and it's like, you know, the Sunday afternoon chick, um, church picnic out on the grounds where everybody brings their fried chicken and this, that, and the other thing. And normally when we do that, um, we do it to share, right? Everybody brings some. We have covered dish in the fellowship hall, and everybody brings food to share. But Paul saw the Corinthians, and what they were doing was the rich people were bringing their big basket of fried chicken and potato salad, and they kept it to themselves and their close friends, and they're over here eating, and they didn't share it with the others. So the poor people coming to the love feast with nothing of their own to eat, and they would take of the Holy Communion, but that was about it. So Paul was really getting on them of the proper observance of the Holy Meal and that it is a meal that we share with Jesus, or he shares with us, and that it's love to be shared with everybody that's there. It's not to hoard your own little meal that you brought in your picnic basket. So that deals with um, gluttony as well. All of this um, requires our trust in God, our trust in God, that he has our best interest at heart. He knows what is best for us. And whatever I think I need more of, if it doesn't line up with what God thinks I need more of, I don't need it. And I have to trust God for that um, renewing of my mind for that wisdom to know the difference we've got to trust him that he will be faithful and give us the strength to do that which will cause Satan to flee from us Satan will flee from us Paul says in Romans uh, chapter 5 I believe it is um, that Resist Satan and he will flee from you. There are four really important words in that verse that we don't always say. <clears throat> they are believe fully in God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So it's all predicated on um, a reliance and a trust in our, in our Lord God. And Satan will flee from us just as he did from Jesus in the wilderness. Guess what? He's looking for another opportune time to come back. And we've got to trust again, do it all over again. Let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, we're a hungry people. We are a spoiled people. We have abundance of food. We have plenteous of all that would satisfy us not only in the way of food, but in uh, the things that we desire in our lives, uh, for the many blessings that you give to us, which oftentimes we think are our entitlement. Help us to remember and to understand uh, the blessing and the joy, the rejoicing that comes with moderation, to trust you in all things, to realize that your Holy Spirit is our guide, is our leader, is our conscience when we stretch the boundaries and that the Holy Spirit also is God with the intent of our perfect good and our holiness to be Christ-like in our lives and to uh, be with you one day in the perfection of your holiness. Lord, I thank you for those who are present here today and those who are joining through other means. We thank you for those means themselves uh, that we have the opportunity to meet together even when it's not in physical presence. And we go forward in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, next week, get all your anger out this week. We'll talk about anger next week. <laughs> Do what? You have to give up anger next week. Give up anger too. <laughs> don't, don't hit anybody in anger. <laughs> Oh.